great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected, only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least, that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey. Hey. So here we are. And we're ready to talk about something that could feel pretty um, separating? I think Distancing? It, it could. And I think it's really interesting. It doesn't have to feel. Okay, what are we going to talk about? You picked the topic. I might have written it down, but you picked it out. Reconciling differences is the first half of the title. Okay. Because... Reconciling differences is something people come to me a lot. And that's that's an important thing to to figure out where where do we overlap how do we overlap better or whatever but then there's also reconciling to be different what about if we don't overlap is that okay what happens then i so i like this title i like this topic because I care a lot about differentiation, about being able to be being not just able to be but being encouraged to be different yes. from you. But also I also like the notion that I can actively seek to reconcile my differences by by engaging, like actually engaging in how you're different from me. Like I can I can know myself better by engaging in that discussion about how we're different. Yes, sure. But in my household growing up, that turned into a whole lot of debate and argument. Debate quickly escalated into argument and mm-hmm. escalated into pretty much just like verbal violence and sometimes a little bit more than verbal violence. What was the debate about? Anything. Oh, any debate Everything. would turn into argument, which would turn to... Yeah, so... I see. Oh, right, so... so Ed, Anger was so the most prevalent... So exposing your differences would, would open you up to the possibility of... Yes. Uh, yeah. It, so it was, it was strange because there was this tension where difference was encouraged because... Um, well, my father liked to debate. He liked to discuss, right? So he would create a, an environment where it was natural to discuss things this way. However, it almost always escalated. So in other words, any difference could easily and almost always did. Literally every night of my childhood ended in escalation into difference becoming 
so separating. So um, dissension, argument, hurt feelings. That's a persistent message that different is trouble. Right. And oh, okay. So when you brought up this topic, I was thinking, cool, d- you know, differentiation. That's, you know, that's about getting to know yourself and making sure that there's space for you to be yourself in your partnership. And great. But right away, uh, up popped this other voice that was like, ah, careful. <laughs> it's dangerous. That's what I hear. Is that what it feels like? It does. It feels a little dangerous because my job in that family system was to be um, to actively engage with my father and argue like that that was my job my job was to get in there and argue and I took that job on in part to protect my mother and brother from his um, very quick-witted fast-moving um, argument tactics and my my brother and my mother were a little bit less sharp about how they were verbally engaging with people, which is actually really nice and made them pleasant people to be around. Um, My father and I were not known for being nice. And so we engaged in this really hostile way. And it took so much effort. It has taken and continues to take so much effort to not see difference as an invitation into argument. Okay, I see. Which is kind of hard because you and I are really different. We are. Um, So you've had quite a bit of experience now managing that situation. And I'm struck right now by the microcosm that I'm hearing you describe of of public discourse. I mean, I go out on the internet and say something and watch what the people who disagree with you say. Some of them will just be like, oh, I think something else, and there'll be a conversation. But so much of it does bring up the the anger and the hostility yeah yeah so when when you were talking about um difference you know reconciling differences i was initially thinking that we would talk about right off the bat i was thinking we would talk about like wanting to spend our time doing different things or wanting to um well, wanting our marriage to be different, like, and, and yeah. trying to negotiate. Uh, yeah. Okay, you want one set of things and I want another. What we want out of life and our relationship and what but, the differences are. But, but then now you're... right away, it turned into something even bigger than that, which is every single place where we are different is an opportunity, at least for, from my perspective, to practice tolerating, like opening the window of tolerance so that I can tolerate embrace accept and joy the fact that you are different than me and you want different things and it's definitely not simple for me how does it feel for you well for me see i was coming into this conversation thinking oh maybe we'll talk about enmeshment and you know codependence and the ways in which we're we're different and how to specifically for me how to um how to extract me from the places that I put me out in the world, trying to be like everybody else. Mm. What if I'm just myself? So that was all like, that's where I was coming from. Um, but what you're talking about, I heard you talking about you, you, I don't remember the exact progression, but tolerate, um, accept, enjoy, you know, moving from withstanding our differences to celebrating them. And I think we've done, we've come a long way from the beginning of our relationship. And it's amazing the difference in how life feels. Yeah, but it's also an area that I think both of us are working on all the time. All the time, absolutely. Because now I'm feeling this tension of, of different ways that I move in the world, different ways I watch clients move in the world. You know, I think we, we have this tendency to classify ourselves as like, oh, I'm codependent, or I'm an avoider, or um, I'm, I'm avoidant and I'm anxious, and mm-hmm. I'm, like, we, we tend to put ourselves in a box, but I, you and I are maybe a really great example of this. You have taken plenty of attachment style quizzes, and you always come up pretty much the same way. You have secure attachment, but, if, but, but your tendency avoidance. is toward avoidance, yeah. minus toward anxious. I have earned secure attachment with you, but definitely anxious. And yet, I also identify as someone who was raised in codependence, was raised to believe that codependence was like a go-to style of of relating, and 
I then aspired to it in my first marriage and I practiced it. So now I'm, here I am, this anxious person, anxiously attached person who also actively has spent the last 13 years really practicing not being codependent to a degree that like it, I feel the tension of myself. Like I, I'm, I'm. Like it's in opposition to. Who I am. Like it, oh, so like my my adult self and my child self are in this dialogue. It's reminding me of okay. transactional analysis and mm-hmm. how, like my adult self and child self are in this dialogue. And and I kind of I I'm lo- I lose a little self coherence. I feel um, I feel a little confused about. Uh, yeah, like, if you're the avoidant one, how come you're the one that's codependent? <laughs> <laughs> I, Apparently, it's not simple. There, right, that. So, yeah. because we so didn't... The label isn't enough. We didn't To say look, that I'm avoidant doesn't explain everything about me. Right. And we weren't looking for this early in our relationship. I think we had put ourselves into these boxes. So, I labeled myself as codependent. And knew that I had a strong history in that and knew I had to work against it, which, but we weren't looking for it in your history. Yep. Um, you didn't have a, a first marriage that looked particularly enmeshed. You didn't have um, a childhood that looked particularly enmeshed. So we didn't go looking for it. But we see it all the time come up in our relationship now. Yep. So it turns out if... If it wasn't in my previous history, then apparently it's possible to just decide to do it anyway. Well, <laughs> don't have to have history. Well, but maybe this is one of the more important points. We haven't talked about this very much. I'm, I, I was trained in psychodynamic theory, which means I think a lot about how we formed who we are in very early stages of development, mm-hmm. right? Like before you're seven years old. A lot of it even before you're two or three years old, right? But we're still growing and changing all the time. We're still alive. Oh, we're mm-hmm. having a life. Yeah. And there are ways in which I, my development is now cycling through new ways of being um, less functionally relational <laughs> than I would like. Yeah. Yep. I have not yet exhausted all the ways I can do relationships poorly. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I definitely haven't. I still got more in the tank. Oh, I mean, good news, bad news, I guess. (laughs) Okay, so I want to go, I want to circle back to this and sum it up because it feels helpful. In early stages of our relationship, we had you pegged as the avoidant one and me as the anxious one. And we had me pegged as the codependent one. That was coherent with that line of thought. Like, oh, she's anxious and she's codependent. She's needy. She, um, she's, she's has some trouble with, um, struggling with like, voicing her needs but other than that it's just a lot I'm going to want a lot of attention Mm -hmm. yeah that's it I'm going to want a lot of attention I'm going to be scrambling I'm going to be pulling at you but we labeled you as being avoidant and we labeled you as being um, overly isolationist and disconnected and not a good relater and those are like those are like mantles that we put on in early stages of our relationship and it's it's a fully fully defined package too like Oh, this is all, all, this is what you get with avoidant it's, attachment is all the these danger. other things. And yeah, it's the danger of taking one of, one of the many personality yep. quizzes or psychometric quizzes of any kind, right? Or, and then extrapolating and then, it. And then forgetting that it's only defining like one little facet yeah. of, of a, a dynamic and brilliant individual. Because... Fast forward a few years into our relationship and tell me about the first time you you realized that it was you who was clinging and all up in my business. Because I don't think you realized it yourself. I think somebody told you. Oh, boy. Okay. The first time? The first time somebody told you that maybe you should just let me, you know, do my work. Somebody you really respect told you this. You don't necessarily mean you, do you? Oh, I mean, no. Like, Fair <laughs> I mean, was I mean, yeah. very helpful to me in in seeing past what what I brought, like the, the the pictures I painted of myself. And he would look at what I what I painted and the to- stories I would tell about what I did, and and yeah, and be like, okay, so great, that's her work. What are you doing? 
Yeah. You know, why, what, are you, what are you doing while she's doing that work? And can you just let her do it for a while? See what happens? So, Thayer, who served as um, a father figure to you at a time when you were doing some big emotional and psychological growth. So he was your analyst and, and he was... Um, but more importantly than being an analyst, it seemed like he really did step into a, um, into your psyche as a father yeah. figure. Oh, yeah. And I remember the day that he told you that you were the one who was enmeshing. You were the one who was like, you had infiltrated every facet of my life. And there, we were losing, we were losing individuality. Mm-hmm. We weren't going to be on our individuation journeys Not because with, we were, yeah. you, you had, and in this case, and I, I want to take full responsibility for being my own person who was allowing this to happen. But he noticed that you had stopped engaging with very many other people and you were, you didn't have a ton of other friends. You didn't, you just, right. you were in, and then maybe more importantly everything I was doing was what you had started to care about yep so I had gone back to grad school and you you cared about that and I was you know whatever book I was reading you were interested in whatever music I was listening to you were interested in yes we yeah. didn't we weren't looking for that pattern nope. not so for me when he pointed it out yeah and I was looking for it myself yep. so I was ha- I was paying attention so I would catch myself had, slipping into it. And you had dabbled in that a little bit early on, but but then what I saw was that your own passions and interests were very strong. And yeah. so you, you pursued them. And then, you know, and it is... I watched you um, pursuing or at least investigating my interests early on, and I was learning how to do relationships different. I was like, okay, uh, let me see what you're doing. Because I don't want to do what I have done. I want to do something new. So, oh, that's the thing you did. Well, I'm going to do that too. And then I did, in fact, enjoy it. I'm really interested in the things that you have have yeah. been investigating. Yeah, so it was authentic. But what it didn't have yeah. was anything else other than what you were, what you brought me. Yeah. Just by being you next to me, because you weren't bringing it to me. You were bringing it to you, and I was going to you and saying, "Hey, what's what's that?" <laughs> like the little brother that I am. Right. So here's another place where another psychological theory can help us understand the many layers of dynamics that were going on because you are a youngest child. I am an eldest child. So if you want to take an Adlerian view, like I, I am, I was born to lead and I had no, no, I have, I never think that I can't just go set off on the next adventure. Like it's always in me to do that. And I always follow my passions and it's a very prototypical move to make yep. as an eldest child, especially one who's parentified. And you were a youngest child and yep. you were not, you don't appear to have been babied too much. No, but I, I do, everything you just described made me want to say, and so then I, as the youngest child from my experiences, am waiting for somebody else to tell me it's okay to do a thing. So and there's my older kids, siblings, yeah. there's there's my my older siblings and their friends all older than me, all doing things and and me with a couple people around in the neighborhood and and being, I mean, if we can go back to the avoidant thing, so I didn't reach out a lot as a kid, but there were all these people, so let me see what I can do. It was a strategy to keep you safe. To it keep wasn't me safe, yeah. yeah. And but then I I'd, I'd reach out, but I'd reach out to these people who were developmentally at a different stage, and they're like they don't want me around necessarily, and but I would try to get them to give me permission to go with them. Mm. So then, and you'd hint that you'd, I, that try would, to is like a very yes, like I'll yep. just I'll just snuggle up yeah, next to you, maybe and I'll, like, maybe I'll if do I the, can I'll be. ingratiate and 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 maybe they'll invite me rather than saying can I? My own little brother was had a reputation for being the cute kid like he he had this like little round cherub face and he would be like all oh he was he literally literally trying to ingratiate himself <laughs> literally yep. he would just like snuggle up and oh can i can i can i he was like and it worked it's not a bad strategy i mean right it works yeah and we see we see that play out in the older and younger kids in our family too so so some of this is just the habits that will occur yeah in families but what I think is interesting 
to me about couples, like we, we couple up, right? And we, so often we, we create then a complementary system, right? So I, if I'm the anxious one, then you have to be the avoidant one. If I'm the codependent one, then you have to be the isolationist yeah, one. You're the green one. I'm the fuzzy one. Right. The classic, the classic fuzzy Kermit and Kermit fuzzy. problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. So polyamory messes with that. Right. Because it, now you don't have this dyad. There's multiple people and you got to figure out. Right. So early in our relating, yeah. it was actually easier for me because mm -hmm. there were three of us. And so it, um, the, the, the triangle created this, oh, okay, actually, I don't really know. We can't just divide things up at a one-for-one one rate. Like, yep. that's not how it goes. We don't just polarize everything into these as if as if everything that was in existence has to be um, divided up as the ends of the polar right. extremes, right? Yep. Like, as if there's not just a world of spectrums to exist in. Yeah. But as, and then, so, and then later on, there was just the two of us and... We, and I certainly put myself in a position. We don't live with any other without, people. We don't so. live with any other people. Uh, and the, the kids don't count because. Not they, for this. Thank not goodness. for this. No, they, we they don't shouldn't be. Them. Yeah, they shouldn't be part of this. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and without adding more people in, in other ways, that, that binary system becomes more and more polarized or can. And it did. Right. So at different times in our relating, I have felt that polyamory or open relating has protected us from becoming overly enmeshed. But yeah. at other times, um, I feel like we've hidden behind it a little bit and assumed that being open or having other people in our lives that were important to us protected us from it. Oh, but, hmm. but here we are. We still own a home together and raise children together and deal with school system together. And even though we homeschool most of them and it, there's still a lot of opportunity for melding yes. for, for yeah, a lot of opportunity for over. Yeah. Particularly over. at the tail end of a long pandemic. Yeah. Know, there were a lot of opportunities to just isolate because we were trying to. Right, so we are um, isolating and again practicing that habit, the habit yep. of I'm this so you're that. Yeah. And so this feels to me like a less functional way of differentiating. So on the one hand, it was good mm. because it helped us be different people because when we first fell for each other, not when we first met each other because we were just children then, but when we first had romantic feelings for each right. other, it, there was so much, it was just projection. There was so much yeah, projection. It was, so, it was projection. so much projection that I remember us being like, oh my gosh, how did we not see how alike we are? We're so alike. We're so alike. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and the fact that we both thought that told us that, yeah, you're both head over heels in love with, you know, a vision of yourself that you see in another person. Yeah. It's not actually about them right now. Luckily, I really did like you. Turns out the person who was behind the projection screen. Yeah. I like you. But at the, in those early days... You were a projection screen for me. I was projecting you all my golden shadow on you. For me, yep. Yeah, and that was very, very tempting to just subsume into. And yet, we had this complex relationship with another person involved and with um, me trying to be open and dating as well. And so then things got simpler for a while because after our triadic situation ended there was a period of time where we were just busy running a business yeah. and i was enrolling in grad school and we were getting married and so it became easy to fall into a different kind so we had we'd gotten through that projection all that golden shadow projection in love stuff we'd gotten through the hardest part of that and realized we aren't actually just alike yep we're actually very very different but then we were introduced to a new phase where now you could become all this and I could become all that. Right. And I don't, I don't know that I could have seen this as it was happening, but I was cutting off pieces of myself left and right. I can't, I can't speak to what you were doing, but I know what I was doing. I was doing exactly what 
Robert Bly describes as, as, you know, just like in childhood when you have pieces of yourself that don't fit and you're asked to just like dissociate those, disown those pieces and you shove them in a long bag, you drag behind you that shadow bag, right? I was doing it again. Yeah, that, that resonates. It, it just made sense. I couldn't be, I couldn't be the sciency one. That was your thing. And you couldn't be the creative one. That was my thing. Right. And yeah, I could feel us doing it. But it was really hard. It was really, really hard at the time to do anything else. It was. And I, I don't know about you, but one of the things that... And I don't, it wasn't the first at all but one of the things that helped me move past this um this this polarity that we're talking about is you were the relational one and i wasn't but it became clear (laughs) in retrospect it's very clear but there there was this very blurry understanding on my part that wait a minute if i'm not relational how am i going to be in a relationship how can i actually be here with you who I wanted so very much to be with. And so I had to figure out how to, how to, that I had to re-understand myself as someone who is relational because that also resonated with a message from my whole life. So it didn't just start there, but it was an easy one to fall into. And then I realized this is never going to work if I don't pick that up. And I'm still trying to pick it up. I think you're doing a really good job of it. Thanks. One of the things that I notice is very different now is when you go on dates, um, you ask me fewer questions. You a- you you mm, ask mm-hmm. me to be less of a mirror for you. Like, am I, you know, am I doing this right? And it's gotten better and better over the course of years. The last couple of dates, when I started dating, I felt like someone who had absolutely no clue what to do in that situation. And in the last couple of dates that I had, I I felt confidence a strong word but maybe like okay I, I know what I'm doing I'm going to go talk to a person I know how to talk to a person I'll just go do that that's exactly and, what I saw and you that, doing instead of twisting myself up in knots saying that I'm not someone who knows how to talk to people that's it because this wasn't about actually I never felt you have fear that you like couldn't be liked it was more like you were just stuck in this idea that yeah. you were like not of the of the human realm and, yeah. and separated yourself right. out and and then would use me as your bridge. Yes. Yep. And my, my um, hard one but strong relationality, you would use that. And yep. now I, I feel you more and more, but really strongly in the last four or five years, owning your own competence. I mean, confidence, yes, and your competence at being a good relator. And that doesn't mean that you don't have habits that aren't you yeah. know ideal yeah but have anti-relational so behaviors and whatnot and that, but now i have other things too right <laughs> now i believe i have other things too so now i, I want to circle back to mm-hmm. our opening idea because i'm thinking about how reconciling differences wasn't actually our problem through most of our relationship around parenting there was plenty of stuff to do yep. but around our our couplehood our romanticism our sex life all of those things we didn't have to reconcile a lot of differences but we've done a ton of reconciling with being different and letting that be not just okay but a strength yes for our relationship Mm -hmm. and i feel like that's something we come back to over and over again and i watch clients come in and when they are When they're first entering my world, right, they often are, they're wobbling. There's something uncomfortable happening because one of them at least has decided that they really want something more in their life. And so there's, there's a wobble. There's a, uh uh-oh, what are we going to do? We want something different. Like this, how will this rock the system? And deciding that it's okay to spend time in the, in the uncomfortable, not knowing place of we are different and we might have been practicing being the same for reasons that aren't really helpful that won't actually facilitate our individual growth yeah. those are the moments where they get to decide to to come into a process of learning to be different and differentiated from from each other and 
even from their own intrapsychic parts, right? Dif- yeah, really was... different. Like really start to sort themselves out in those early weeks of work. Often there'll be these these wobbles where there's a, a temptation back to we're identical. We we're the same. Yeah. We are one mm-hmm. unit. And that temptation, well, I would say it doesn't ever told it's never totally disappeared for me. I have to remind myself to I'm, stay out of it. I do. I yep. Because it's up often. It's a for me. It's a it's a it, it's a an oasis not an oasis what's that a, a mirage oh yeah that that idea that if i'm the same as you i'll be safe in this relationship is a mirage it's not it's, real it, it is a mirage if if that were true if you and i were the same in this relationship we would have a whole host of problems right different ones than we have right now but they it would be really difficult to work with them since we'd both be having the same problems at the same time. Right. Now we have different problems at different times and can support each other in ways I can support you because I'm not having the emotional response to a particular thing that's happening right now. So I can help you with yours and and you do the same thing with me all the time. Right. So one of the places that we have learned and we lean into as being a, a strength of ours, and I see this come up with couples all the time, is one, our reactivities aren't going to be the same. Like the places where we are most emotionally reactive are often different because we grew up in different households and we had different histories and we lived different lives. Great. So if we can acknowledge that we have these strengths and weaknesses in our, uh, in our ability to like self-regulate in our ability to be in relationship in our ability to just manage life, then the process of becoming, uh, you know, like uh, the process of learning how to do this relationship thing can rely on those strengths. Yes. We can lean into mm-hmm. them. Um, so you can, for instance, support me when I am experiencing dissociation because I still do. I still experience dissociative bouts where because a whole bunch of stuff has happened in my life. I'll go through periods of time when that's a, that's a way that I react and you don't have that same tendency. And so you're able to lean in there. There are other ways that we can access each other's strengths and weaknesses, but we also don't have to give up on the fact that just because I have a tendency to dissociate some doesn't mean that I am now the dissociative one. Yes. Right. I mean, um, because that's not, that is in no way the sum total of me. Oh. I'm struck by how the the uh, the strength of our our process boils down to once again <laughs> the lens of multiplicity, but turned yes. on ourselves. But turned on ourselves, on on letting on our individual selves and of each other. Right, letting you be more than one thing. Yeah. I let myself be more than one thing. I let myself have more than one feeling. I pay attention to the fact that you can have more than one feeling, so you might be reactive, right. but also calm at the same time. Different parts of you might be feeling different ways, or you might feel very differently in a very short span of time. These are, this has been an illuminating half hour for me because sometimes I forget how far we've come yeah, and how long a road there still is to live together. <laughs> it's not it's not a bad thing it's a good thing it it actually makes me really hopeful that just because we actually have gotten to a place where I feel really safe in our relationship doesn't mean we're going to get stagnant right and that's that's a big win for me because the little girl who was raised in chaos still lives in here thinking she needs to start more chaos because the only time she's loved is when everything's falling apart And if I can be patient and still and just take in the fact that we are growing during these quiet, calm conversations that did not require chaos or breakdown, there's not going to be a lack of growth and love and attention. So thank you. And I know I... what, What an amazing spot to be in 10 years from now I wonder what it will look like to look back on this time okay so I'm 
Okay, action step then. I'm going to close this whole episode with an action step. Oh. We're going to record this episode It's and, and hit, the, hit the button. And we're going to publish it. And it'll just be out there in the world. But probably we won't go back and think about it very much. Other than I'll make some social media. And you'll take some clips. And we'll send it out to our email list. And that's all great. I'm going to go to futureme.org. Future. And send us both a link to this episode. 10 years in the future. Because this, this is just a website you can go to and you send yourself an email and it's going to pop up into your inbox later. And I use this tool for myself a lot and I recommend it for clients to write yourself a note that's really important for you to read later. Because while journaling is great, journaling doesn't just naturally pop back up in your life. And there is nothing like seeing a former version of yourself to realize how very valuable all the stuff you've gone through is. So I'm going to set this one for 10 years, a time right. capsule. Awesome. And I totally invite the audience to do the same. Um, write yourselves a letter. Take a note. Where are you now in your relationship? What have you learned in the last couple years in your relationships? And uh, yeah, send it off to yourself in the distant future. Like 10 years is... Wow. A long time. It's a, it's a while. It's a while. Awesome. Thanks for having this conversation with me. And thank you. Relationships can be really messy. And keep talking to each other. And that's other. good news. And keep talking to each other. And gratitude. Gratitude. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast, out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news.